All righty. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Val Swisher. I am the CEO of Content Rules. And today I want to talk about content transformation. There are a number of reasons why I want to talk about content transformation. But it came to me, oh, I would say about a year ago, that every customer that I went to visit wanted to talk about digital transformation. Digital transformation, on and on, it was all I heard about. And this was from Techcom, uh, this was from Marcom, this was everywhere. So I decided to get a couple of definitions of digital transformation, and Wikipedia says it's the novel use of digital technology to solve traditional problems. Okay. Seems like what we do every day, right? Uh, Salesforce says it's the process of using digital technologies to create new or modify existing business processes, culture, and customer experiences. Okay, great, great. When I talk to customers, the first thing that always comes to mind are tools. Tools, tools, tools. Content management systems, marketing automation systems, AI, cognitive systems, all kinds of tools. So a lot of companies, when they are uh, tasked with doing digital transformation, the first thing they do is they run and they get the tools. The problem is that the tools don't create this new experience, right? In order to give a customer a new experience, you actually have to do something with your content. I have a new favorite saying. My new favorite saying is, if you put the same crappy content into a new expensive tool, you end up with expensive crappy content. So what I want to talk about really is transforming your content so that it works with these wonderful tools that we now have on the market. Because far too often, I run into situations where customers have great tools, but things are still not working the way they want them to work. So what is content transformation? Content transformation is taking your existing content and changing it. It's making that content more versatile. It's making it so that you can use and reuse that content. It moves your content from one size fits one to one size fits many. And as we're going to see today, it's more than just changing your file extension and file type. It's way more than that. It's really reimagining your, your existing content and your new content because we all know the problems of monolithic content. Doesn't scale, you can't reuse it, really hard to search, inconsistent, redundant, all these things. And Personalized experiences, those experiences where you want to deliver the right content to the right person at the right time on the right device in the language of their choice, it's really not scalable or possible. What I have been seeing in the marketplace quite a bit uh, the past couple of years is what I call structured authoring fail or did a fail. Structured authoring fail is when a company spends good money on good software, but nobody learns how to change the way they write. So what you end up happening, have happening, and I've seen this too many times, is people will, for example, take an entire FrameMaker chapter and stick it into one topic. So now, rather than having a 20-page chapter, I had a 20 page topic. I have, I have done nothing but made my life more painful. If you're not going to do the work of 
working on your content and re-envisioning your content, stay in unstructured frame. Just, just, it's, that's the tool for you. But if you want to use structured content and DITA, structured frame maker and AEM, then you need to move away from monolithic content and you need to transform your existing content so that you can use it the right way. So how do we do this? There are four steps that we're going to talk about in a little more detail. Locating your content, deciding which content you're going to work on, deciding how you're going to work on it, and then actually doing the work. So we'll start at locating your content. In the best of all possible worlds, you will locate all of your content. And if you had, if I had the video on, you'd see my hand going around in a circle, all the content. Where are you going to find your content? Oh my gosh, content is everywhere, right? Every repository shares hard drives. How much content is on people's personal hard drives? ACK, email, Slack channel, wiki. Uh, every kind of source code management, Git, Perforce, whatever you have in the product itself, back of a napkin, wherever you can find your content, you want to find it. You need to first and foremost know what content you have. This is not a small task, as many people already know. Uh, and the longer your company has been around, then the more content your company has in more places and you need to find it. And when you find it, I really recommend creating an inventory so that you know not only the file name, right, and the title, but you know who wrote it. You know the, the last uh, date that it was uh, worked on. You know the revision. You know the type of content it is. You have analytics. Is this content something that people are actually accessing, or is this content really just no one's using it? So you need to have a bunch of information to help you decide what content you're going to transform and what content you're not. And remember, right now I'm talking about uh, legacy content and content that is not already in DITA. Once you have found all your content, then you basically want to have three different buckets. The first bucket is I'm going to take this content and I'm going to split it into components, but I'm not going to rewrite it. I'm just going to take the content. I'm going to chunk it up, right? I'm going to have some tasks and going to have reference, whatever, but I'm not going to rewrite it. That's one thing you can do. Another bucket is I'm going to take this content and not only am I going to reformat it, I'm actually going to rewrite it and look at my best practices. And at this stage, when we work on transformation projects with customers, we really start digging in and looking for reuse, right? Because one of the reasons we're moving into DITA into structured frame is because we want to reuse content. So I'm going to start taking that content and rewriting it, rewriting those different topics so that I don't have seven of the same topic. I only want one. So that's, another, you know, the second thing I could do. And then the third bucket of content that you'll end up with is content that you're just going to leave as it is. You're not going to transform it. Uh, you're probably going to have some type of repository for it, but you're not going to chunk it up or rewrite it or do any of those things with it. So how do I decide what content I'm going to work with? For the content that you're actually going to transform, it's probably going to be the content that is popular, that people are using, 
Perhaps it's uh, about highly visible products. Sometimes we transform content because we know it has a high reuse potential. And we really, again, want one topic of that one piece of content. And that way we only have to deal with updating it once, translating it once, all the things that we already know. Evergreen content, content that is boilerplate, it's always there. Maybe it's your trademark uh, paragraph or um, the, the whole uh, support numbers, what to do if you have a problem information. So you're going to want to take with you when you move to structure this content that you really care about. The content that you don't want to take with you is probably short-term content or content that's about products that no, are no longer supported. I know sometimes we have to keep docs around even if a product is no longer supported, but you know, for the most part, if you've end of life the product, you can end of life the content. Things that are time dependent. Um, whether it's an event or it's it's something that has to do with a moment in time. Here's an interesting one. If the expense to transform the content is more than the value of the content, you really need to think about that content. Do you need it or don't you need it? If you think you need it, what can you do to make it more valuable? Content that nobody is looking at that doesn't fall into those, you know, evergreen uh, boilerplate type content. And when you have poorly written content, it's much better to rewrite it than to try to transform it. And we're gonna talk about best practices in transforming the content so you know what I mean by, by this. But oftentimes, um, it's not just a matter of chunking it up and, and tagging it. We really need to uh, rewrite it in a way that is reusable, where a chunk can be mixed and matched with other chunks so that you can create new and different assets when you publish. In my practice, in my mind, there are three different ways that you can go about transforming your content. The first one is software only. For example, frame to XML or Word to XML or InDesign or whatever it is. So converting your file format. Software only because there's software out there to do that. The next and the one that I think is the most popular is you're going to convert the formats, but you're also going to revise the content. So you're going to uh, revise it so that it complies with your content models. Uh, you're going to revise it so that um, only task information is in a task and you're going to have to tease it apart and get your conceptual information into concepts. Uh, concept topics, et cetera. You're going to organize it. You're going to have a taxonomy. You're going to need to tag it with metadata. And I know there's lots of other presentations over the course of this um, event to talk about all these other things. Again, you're going to want to deduplicate that content and consolidate it. You don't want seven of the same topic. And I've seen it all too often. That's what most people are going to do. Now, I recommend you take it a step further. I recommend that in addition to complying with your structured authoring guidelines and models and all that, you also standardize your terminology. You standardize your style, your grammar, your voice, your tone. And the reason this is critical is that to achieve this promise of digital transformation, 
You need to be able to mix and match topics, creating new maps whenever you need them and outputting them to whatever format you need, whenever you need. And the only way you're going to successfully mix and match is to standardize your terminology, your style, your grammar, your voice, etc. And we'll see what happens in a few slides if you choose not to do this. Doing the work is important. And I know, as well as everyone knows, that when you're embarking on this journey to move from unstructured frame to structured frame, when you're moving into DITA, you have your current content that you need to work on. Nobody has said, oh, don't worry about that. You don't need to work on the next release of this product content. Just take this moment in time and move all your other content. Nobody gets the luxury of this, and it becomes very uh, challenging to find the time to do this work. But it's important because you don't want to leave this content behind, and you need your content to be structured so that you can deliver these personalized experiences so that you can actually train the AI systems that are coming in the future, some are somewhat here, but still coming, and adapting to different delivery platforms. I, people often ask me, well, how are we gonna get that done, Val? And we don't have the time. You know, we, we hear what you're saying, we agree with you, but we just simply don't have the time. And there are a number of ways to go about this, this change management, if you will, content change management. I had a customer once that I thought did the smartest thing that I've seen in terms of setting up up to be successful with transforming legacy content. They wanted to do two things at the same time. One is they wanted to make sure that all of their writers understood how to work in this new structured environment. At the same time, they had all of this legacy content that was unstructured that they needed to move to structure. They had a, they had hundreds of writers, but they had different departments and groups and they had training involved and knowledge base and all kinds of people involved. They gamified the entire process. They basically told each writer, you need to take at least, I think it was 25 pieces of content and move them into this new paradigm. That's mandatory. But whoever can do the most by this date would get this prize. And they started splitting it up. Whoever uh, transformed the most uh, knowledge base articles would get this prize and they really made it fun and they accomplished everyone having a small piece of how to do the work and making it a little less cumbersome a little less dreaded and it actually became a little bit of a competition and they have the most successful model that I have seen in terms of getting a lot of people to learn this way of writing, because it is a different way of writing, and to get all of that content and bring it with them. So that was, I, I wish I had thought of it, I didn't, but that was the best one I've heard of yet. Okay, so let's now talk about how we do this and what the best practices are for taking that content and bringing it into this new paradigm. As we've already said, it's, it's more than just converting the format. You really want to take that monolithic content, you wanna make it dynamic, you wanna make it modular, you wanna be able to create a customized, personalized experience. 
So we're going to talk about all of these things, how to transform your content, chunking, all these things. I'm going to talk in depth, but here's, here's your bulleted list. All right. The first thing you want to do is you want to create small units of content. You want to create topics. You want to make them versatile, reusable. You want to make sure that you're reusing content as much as possible so you don't have to have many variations. And you want to make sure that you can mix and match them so that you can create that personalized output. Clearly, you're going to want to use discrete content types because that is one of the ways to chunk your content. So in DITA, of course, we have tasks and concepts and references and uh, troubleshooting and other things, but even non-DITA content can also be in discrete types, like descriptions or video, tutorials, quizzes, etc. People often ask me, how big or how small should a given chunk of content be? And there's really no magic answer to this. Some companies decide they're going to standardize at a certain heading level. Um, all heading level two and below becomes its own chunk or, or something like that. What I say is that you need a piece of content that is small enough to stand on its own. That does, you do not need to look at any other content in order to understand this piece of content. And you need this piece of content that uh, is big enough that it, it covers all the things someone needs to know about it. So what you're really doing when you're creating these discrete content types is you're creating islands of content that on their own can each tell the, the full story of what that piece of content needs, but doesn't say a word more than that. It is big enough to just tell the story of that piece. And it is small enough that it doesn't tell pieces of anything else. And with practice, you get good at this. You really start to understand uh, kind of the art and science of what size topic is the right size topic. If you have followed anything that I've been talking about in, oh, I don't know, I've been talking for 26 years, so if you've followed any of that, you know that I am uh, a fanatic about terminology. Terminology is so critical, is so enmeshed in reuse that I simply don't understand how a company can work in a structured environment, reuse content, and not standardize and manage their terminology. It boggles my mind. I don't understand. Let's take an example. Let's say, for example, we want to write a little how-to about this animal on the screen. Well, what are we going to call this animal? Are we going to call it a dog? Are we going to call it a canine? Are we going to call it a hound, a puppy, a pooch, a snickerdoodle? What are we going to call this animal? And believe me, I don't care what you call it as long as you pick one and you always use the same word. Because if you don't, you can easily end up with someone writing a topic on how to walk the dog and someone else writes a topic on how to train the canine or how to feed the hound. And you go to put all of these topics together into your nice little how-to, and people get confused. Well, gosh, is a canine the same thing as a dog? Is there something special about a hound? Do a canine 
I'm, this is dog care. The stuff that we write about every day is far more complicated than dog care. So you must standardize your terminology. And if you're not standardizing and you're reusing content, I am mind boggled at how your customers can follow along with you because terminology by kumbaya does not work. Okay, next thing, and I've already alluded to this, best practice for, for transforming content or creating new content. Avoid dependent language. You do not want to have a topic that refers to another topic or requires the user to read another topic to understand this topic. And you don't want to refer to other topics or use language like previously, as we discussed later on, because you're creating small, reasonable topics and you do not know where or when they will be reused in the future. So the less dependent language you have, the more reusable your content is. And that's very different from, from writing monolithic content, really trying to avoid that dependent language. Something that, uh, that we come across all the time, and um, this is important for structure, but it's, it's really important just for good quality writing, and that is standardizing your titles, using consistent titles all across all of your content. And your titles are your guideposts. It, their titles tell you what is this information about? Why should I read it? People want to be able to navigate through your content quickly. The more you can standardize on your terminology, on your writing style, on your grammar, and on your titles, the easier it is for people to move through that content. We're not writing the great next great American novel or next great European novel or wherever you live. We're writing technical information. So some messy content, messy titles that I, that you find. If you have one asset that you publish and one title says creating user groups and another title says user management and you've put them together in your asset, messy, messy, much better to standardize, uh, create a new user group, modify a user group, right? Introduction to wonderful product. Features colon WP. I wish I had made these up, but I've seen this. It, again, it doesn't matter what you pick, just be consistent. Wonderful product overview, wonderful product features, wonderful product installation instructions, whatever. Okay. Tutorials, tutorial this, tutorial that. Make it consistent. Consistency will never steer you wrong, especially when you're taking separate topics and you're putting them together. A lot of times we meander around the point we're trying to make. What I want you to think about, whether you're transforming existing content or creating new content, is I want you to pretend that your users are only going to see the title and the first sentence. So your first sentence should be the answer, if you will, to your title. Don't make me read through a paragraph or two or three before you get to the point. 
So start off really strong. Use clear words, use simple words, use as few words as you possibly can. The average reading level in the United States is between sixth and eighth grade. I've seen sixth grade, I've seen eighth grade, I've seen seventh grade. So just let's just figure it's middle school. We want simple words. We want simple sentence structures. We want to get to that point using as few words as we possibly can. This is going to help with so many things. It's going to help you with readability on all levels. It's going to help you with translation. We just got through hearing all about XLIF and, and translation. The fewer words you have, the easier it is to translate, the less expensive it is to translate, and the better your translations are going to be. And it's going to help you with being able to mix and match your topics. Because again, the whole point of transforming your content when you're in a reuse situation is to be able to seamlessly put together those topics so that it looks like one person wrote everything. So start strong, get to that point, use simple words and use as few of them as you possibly can. See, this could have been four separate best practices right here. You should do that. Hopefully, you have structured authoring guidelines that really define everything that your writers are supposed to be doing. They define uh, when to use what kind of topic type. They define things like how big a topic should be. They define, uh, they can also define your style rules. They can define your grammar rules. When you have an opportunity to take existing legacy content and move it into a new paradigm, you really want to take the time to make sure that what you produce follows your guidelines. If you manage the tone of voice and you want to manage your branding so that everything is consistent, and I know a lot of times we're working in technical content and we think there's no branding or we think our content isn't being used in a sales situation, but we know that that's wrong. We know that people look at technical content when they're evaluating a major purchase before they buy. So we want to make sure that the voice and the tone and your branding is consistent across the enterprise. And you have this opportunity when you're transforming your content to make sure that happens. Taxonomy and metadata are very critical when you're moving into structure. And there's uh, metadata that I consider internal and metadata that I consider external. And they both, metadata, the, the both internal and external share the same purpose, and that's making sure that whatever it is you just wrote about can be easily found. Now, why do I say there's internal and external? In my experience, when we're creating content, we need to tag it in such a way that other writers are going to be able to find it. Because if I'm writing something and I know that my new first step, rather than starting at page one and going to page 300, my new first step is to check the CCMS and see whether a topic already exists. I need to be able to find that topic instantaneously because if I can't find it within a minute or two, I'm just going to create another topic 
that's almost the same, but not exactly, to a topic that already exists. And when we tab for internal search, we often use different metadata, different keywords than what our customers might use to locate that content. Years ago, when I was a writer, I worked with a company that had, um, they had code names for their products. And it was a hardware company. And there were two different versions of the same product. One had more features and one had fewer features. And the code names for these products were Fred and Barney. So until product management came up with a name for these products, we all referred to these products as Fred and Barney. And we're talking about a lot of years ago. And without fail, content was published to customers using Fred and Barney because someone had missed changing the internal code name with the real product name. So we're going to have metadata. I, I would never expect a user, a customer, to search for Fred as metadata. But I would expect my neighbor who used to sit ne next to me but now sits in their own house, my virtual neighbor, who's also a writer, to be able to search on internal metadata, internal code names, and things like that. So for external searchability, we want to make sure that we have tagged every piece of content so that it can be easily found. So for example, this particular uh, product is a medium blue cotton shirt, and I should be able to get to it from any of those search terms. So if I want to see all the medium shirts, I can see them. If I want to see all the blue, I can see them. If I want to see everything that's a shirt, I can see it. Creating your taxonomy, which is your organization, and then assigning appropriate metadata, which is the actual tag, is a very important and detailed process. It's, it's not something that can be done uh, quickly in a day. It, you need to spend time making it scalable. You don't know what you're going to need in the future. So you want to make sure that as you set up your taxonomy and your metadata, you allow for it to also be expanded as your needs change. It's an easy thing to say and a hard thing to do. Another best practice when we're going from monolithic legacy content into structured content has to do with figures and tables. You want to be really careful in how you reference them, and you want to make sure that you don't put the number of the figure into the figure. Because once again, you do not know where this figure is going to be used. It could be used in many places. So you can work with variables. That's a way to do it. You certainly can do that. There are other, you know, there are strategies to have, but the main thing is to define your strategy and to apply it consistently. So if you're going to use a variable, that's fine, but you don't want to embed it in the figure. You, you actually can't do that, but you don't want to embed any of that text in the figure. When you're referring to the figure, you need to be, be careful of things like above and below, because you don't necessarily know where this figure is going to be put once it's output. So you need to be conscious of the fact that labeling and referring to things uh, needs to be well thought out in advance, and you need to have a strategy for it. Similarly, you don't want to embed your text 
in your figure. It's a problem with any automated process that is going to act on your content. So for example, it's problematic in translation, right? Uh, uh, machine translation does not go into your figure and it's just to grab text. It's problematic for any optimization software, like uh, if you heard uh, Volker from Acrolinks today. Uh, so Acrolinks or, or Congri or HyperSTE or Cordoba, any of those. You want to make sure that your text is separate from your illustration. The best practice that I have seen is to use callouts that are numbered and then to have a table that, or usually it's done in a table. I mean, you could do it with a list, but a table is usually the, the best way to do it. That defines each number, and then that's in text, and then all these different automatic uh, types of processes can act on that, that text. All right, so digital transformation is more than new tools. If you take the same crappy content and put it into an expensive, expensive new tool, you end up with expensive, crappy content. I'm like, sing along with me. You want to make sure that when you take existing legacy monolithic content, and you split it up into topics that you always keep in mind reusing that content. You need to decide what content you're going to take with you, what content you're going to leave behind, and then when you take that content with you, you need to decide, are you just gonna work on the file formats and just have it chunked? or you're going to chunk it and you're going to rewrite parts of it, or my favorite, are you going to chunk it, are you going to make sure it's written for reuse, and are you going to standardize your terminology, your grammar, your style, right, your to tone, your voice? Because when you standardize your content, you can create that personalized digital experience that management is telling you to create because you can truly make those components mix and matchable and each component stands on its own yet interacts with other components in a seamless way and at the point of delivery that's where you're going to build that personalized asset. So my name is Val Swisher. I have lots of tattoos. I believe that content should be easy to read, efficient to create, and cost-effective to translate. It's been my mantra for a long, long time. I am the author of four books. My fourth book is The Personalization Paradox. Why Companies Fail and How to Succeed at Delivering Personalized Experiences at Scale. And it will be published this year, come hell or high water, by XML Press. I own a company called Content Rules. We've been in business for 26 years. We work with customers on every part of their content journey. We help customers develop a strategy. Uh, we help customers move from unstructured content to structured content. We help customers with their global content strategy. We help customers transform their content because sometimes customers don't have the time to do all these things that we've been discussing. So we come in and we do that for you. We also do a lot of writing and editing and illustration and course development and anything in the content development arena. And uh, we work with both Acrolinks and Congri. We are a reseller and service provider for both of those uh, optimization software packages. And we can also help you even if you don't 
have one of those software packages to make sure that your content follows your standards. You can find out all about this at contentrules.com. And with that, I have left uh, about 10, 15 minutes for any questions that people might have. Great job, Bill. Great job, Val. Uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks so much. I, I, <clears throat> I always laugh, really love the style you present. <laughs> you have so much energy and passion. It comes over so so <laughs> so cool that you're really soaked into the presentation and you're listening to it and list, watching the slides and so on. It's uh, it's amazing. It's <laughs> really a pleasure well, to have you here. Thank you so much. And having a three o'clock. Uh, my time, three o'clock session. I mean, I know people are presenting at midnight for them, so I shouldn't complain. But you know, <laughs> gotta, gotta keep, gotta keep that coffee flowing. Yeah, yeah. There was a quite active chat going on, um, but not really questions as far as I can no, see. I had, a, I had a great observation I wanted to share. So this is from Daniel, and he, and Daniel said, uh, "I feel she's going point by point all the way through the problems we're facing right now in the company I work for." in relation to our documentation. <laughs> oh, Daniel, I feel your pain. I so feel your pain. Well, it's true because upper management, when you get them to agree to take this important step, what what they don't often understand is that it it's it takes time. You know, you, you actually have to do a lot of things. <laughs> and if you want to bring that legacy content, legacy content is gold, right? It's really important. It's going to take time. So um, I feel I feel your pain. I, I really yeah. do. And I, yeah, I, with I, the I, legacy content, with, uh, I think you just made a very important sentence, uh, Val, uh, with a legacy content is gold. While it might look often not look like gold on the surface um, when you look at the technical structure of it or so. Um, but um, it's it's content that was created over many years and uh, it's often the knowledge of the company, so to say, that is uh, pressed into words there. Um, maybe it's locked in some um, binary silo or so, but um, it's valuable content. The content itself is valuable. I, and, I uh, think so. Yeah. That, uh, and sometimes, uh, yeah, and I think sometimes um, we are a little bit too fast in throwing it away, so to say, and say, okay, let's let's do a restart, and now we do everything better and cool and um, uh, do it the right way, uh, like we do it today, and so on, uh, and let's forget the legacy content. But very often, it's very worthy to look at the legacy content and think about strategies, how to migrate it into the new world. And you had this one uh, slide that impressed me a lot, uh, um, at, uh, relatively at the beginning where you said, um, um, some people just convert their 20 page uh, Framica unstructured document into a 20 page data document and uh, continue to work in Framica. And they have a long monolithic 20 page data topic. Um, and uh, that is exactly what I see uh, see a lot as well. Um, and uh, in Framica 2020, by, by the way, we have a document splitter uh, where you can automatically split down um, and chunk down topics based on headings and so, um, because that's exactly the point. You, uh, it's not enough to just do a one-on-one -on -one conversion. You also need to think about uh, how to um, restructure the content and break it down into smaller chunks and so on. So, uh, you know, yeah, it's, a lot it's of, interesting. A lot of it's good stuff in this presentation. We, yeah. um, we have a, uh, a name for that. We actually are working with more and more companies that are in what we call DITA round two, meaning mm -hmm. they deployed DITA a while ago, but no one ever taught their writers how to write for a structured environment. So, yep. and, and years ago, we didn't have, you know, a tool like what you provide where, um, it would it would chunk even at a heading level, but even if we did, people didn't understand. So it's amazing to me how many companies we are working with right now, today, that have 20 page topics. And yeah. when they when they want to start something new, they copy and paste the topic and start tweaking yeah. it. And I'm ready yeah. to throw myself out a window. I mean, you know, why did you go through this pain? <laughs> Why go there? So, yep, absolutely. Yeah, that document splitter is very handy. And and 
particularly when you're going to be moving that content into any sort of structure, perhaps Dita. And uh, yeah, so the, the new feature video is pretty good on that. I had to put that mm -hmm. together. That was one of the longer ones. So if you guys need a quick instruction on that, just run to YouTube and, and search that out. Yep, but let's remember that it's more than just chunking it up. You know, we, we you can't yeah, just chunk it up, yeah. um, especially yeah. if you want to mix and match between, you know, different kinds of outputs. Yep. It's, it's really important that you examine that content and make sure it is reusable. Very important. <laughs> yeah. 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 And when I read through the comments here, well, um, you probably didn't have time for that yet. Um, but there's there are a lot of comments also um, about um, management and um, making the case, the business case there, and convincing upper management uh, about um, uh, the importance of a proper content strategy and stuff like that. So there's there are these not only technical challenges but also management challenges. Um, where um, the tech um, technical communication department sometimes really need uh, support also in uh, how to make the business case and uh, explain it to upper management uh, yes. what can be done better and why it doesn't cost money. <laughs> so yeah, uh, well, so why companies need to invest money into content? That is also <laughs> oh my God. A presentation from Volker, yeah, right. Um, Volker, uh, Volker Smith at the beginning, um, wait, I said uh, the value of content for an enterprise. Uh, so um, that fits fits good together, I think. Yes. On one more. Thing. So Tahari mentioned that uh, you know, when they're relaunching the the B two B side of their org, the content gets converted. And one thing that we don't talk about much is that during that conversion, a lot of the content will need to be rewritten because it's not in the format that might be anticipated by the content model. So it's one of those yeah. things that can't just be converted, right? The authors have to go in. And Produce content that didn't exist or eliminate content that no longer fits the model. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to back up just a, a second and address the business case to management issue. I don't think we really determine the cost of creating content uh, in a way that includes truly all of the costs. I think that when we look at how much it costs to write content and, and even translate content, I know that with translation, you know, we got a certain number of words and a price per word and all this stuff, but we forget, we leave out. How much do we pay people to review our content? How much do we pay people to do an in-country review? When you do an in-country review, you're asking someone who has a different job. Nobody has the job of in-country reviewer, right? You have, you're asking someone to step away from their job and review this content. So you have lost opportunity costs and you have the cost that you're paying that person. And it's the same in, in, in your source language. Anyone who's reviewing your content, that's a cost. So it's, it's, when you look at savings for structure and reuse, yes, you can look at the cost of writing. You certainly can look at the cost of desktop publishing, uh, multilingual desktop publishing. I have customers that spend more on layout of their translations than they do on the translations. But you have to take into consideration every person's rate. <laughs> what does every single person in your organization make? How many hours do they spend? And if you reuse content, how much savings are you going to have? And we can get to real money much faster if we actually consider all the costs, not just the ones that are obvious. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, right now, a couple of new questions are coming in. Um, not sure if we can cover all of them in the last uh, couple of minutes. Um, um, before we start with the uh, closing keynote. Uh, so I would like to ask you to um, stay a little bit in the room and uh, look at the Q&A pod and maybe you uh, want to answer one or the other question. Sure. Um, there are questions like um, about technical nomenclature, um, internal, external techs, um, 
Um, so maybe you want to have a look at that and uh, can answer mm -hmm. the questions in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. I pick one now uh, for the last minutes <laughs> sure. um, from Nadine Murray. Um, she asked, uh, well, I dislike the idea of using a casual tone and voice uh, because I think it won't translate well easily <laughs> or well or easily. Uh, what's your opinion on that? <laughs> oh, I have an opinion. Fancy that. Um, I think we need to be really careful. I think that we have really swung the pendulum much too far in terms of the way we address our customers. We've gone from very formal to my customer is my new BFF. And that doesn't work. Yeah. Because not all your customers want to be your BFF. Certainly some of your your uh International customers do not want to be your BFF. That language doesn't translate. It just doesn't. My opinion, my preference is that your content, your tone of voice should be, it can be casual, but it needs to be simple. It needs to be complete sentences. You want to use a contraction, that's fine, but you need a full sentence. Each time, you can't assume that someone knows your inside joke. No one knows your inside joke. I was working with a company that does, uh, you know, those, those bracelets that you wear to exercise. And the app said in the morning, rise and shine. And no one outside of the U.S. could understand what the heck they were talking about. What does rise <laughs> and shine? It's meaningless. Say, yeah, that's a question of localization then, not translation, okay. but localization. Uh, yeah. You know, if your content is full of idioms, it's not going to be localizable. Localize, yeah. yeah, localizable. You're going to end up having to either find a matching idiom, which isn't going to work. You're gonna, just going to end up writing it in plain language. And if you started with plain language, everybody would win. Yeah. That's my opinion. That's, <laughs> that's an interesting approach, yeah. And there are all these also uh, cultural aspects uh, in that. Um, so let's say, for for example, in the U.S., it's very common to call uh, each other by the first name uh, right away. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Germany, that's a complete no-go. <laughs> so. Right. And recently, recently, an uh, insurance company called me, wanted to sell some insurances to me. And uh, mm -hmm. he said, hey, Stefan, uh, we have these uh, new insurance for travel loss and so. And I was like, <laughs> do we know each other? <laughs> so yeah, why exactly. Why are you calling me Stefan? <laughs> so exactly. There, there are these cultural um, um, differences as well that you need to take into consideration when uh, doing uh, or trying to adopt uh, such strategies uh, to international markets. Okay. Um, Again, um, um, well, thank you so much. Uh, would it be great if you can stay a few more minutes sure. in the room and answer a couple of